speaker this morning is our little bundle of energy, Reverend Sonia Davidson, who is going to bring you a message of light and love and hope and resurrection of that indwelling spirit within us. Please help me welcome Reverend Sonia. Thank you, Carol. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right, ladder. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. All of us who are here in the sanctuary and also those who are joining us on the World Wide Web. I really appreciate the fact that we are all here because I know some of us are just waiting to go to don our carnival costumes and, uh, and uh, revel. As it's, it's fine, it's good, it's good. But I appreciate you being here. I will try to let you leave earlier than usual. I will try, you notice I said try. I once heard someone say with great conviction, no one can be happy all the time. The statement stopped me in my tracks because until then, it had never occurred to me to give it a thought. It did not seem right to me at the time, and it doesn't seem right to me now. I have a confession to make because I consider myself one of those persons who would be continually happy, not necessarily continuously happy. Go look it up in the dictionary, right? <laughs> so, you know, often we bury our happiness inside of us, covered over by all kinds of conditions for what we must have or what conditions must be met in order to be happy. Sometimes we go in the opposite direction, denying ourselves the pleasure of desire by adopting a defeatist attitude, which informs us that, what's the use of trying? I'm too old, too tired, safer to keep to myself, it's too difficult, it's too late, and I can go on and on and on ad infinitum. Perception is a choice. You see, you see what you want to see. If you look for happiness, Happiness finds you. Choose consciously what you are looking for today. You will see a difference if you are willing to see things differently. Decide to be happy and the universe will respond accordingly. Know and believe that there is a principle, a scientific law which supports your decision. Know that there is a method of invoking the law. Use it. As for me, I will not apologize for intending to be happy all the time. I cannot resist sharing this cute story of John Lennon of the Beatles' fame with you. I tell it in his words. When I was five years old, my mom always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote happy. They told me I did not understand the assignment. And I told them they did not understand me. Happy people know themselves and do not allow others to define them. Does it mean that I will not have moments of fear, irritation, disappointment? Perhaps but I will not entertain them so they cannot take root in my consciousness, nor will I intend to have a life which is devoid of continual happiness. My friend, Dr. Kledikak, shared with me an alternate word to happiness. It's called nirvana. It originated with the well-known philosopher, Joseph Campbell. Nirvana, he said, is the extinguishing of the threefold flame of desire, hostility, and delusion. You mean I can't want anything? No, not that. It's just knowing, it's just a quiet, gentle knowing that whatever I will ever require will be provided on time and in order 
whenever I need it. So there's no need for me to keep feeling a sense of separation from anything that I want in my life. Because you know what sense of separation does? It separates you from the thing you want. You know, friends, I'm convinced it's never too late. And it's, it's, not, it's not, definitely not impossible for all of us, every one of us without exception, to be happy all the time. We start with knowing we can and will achieve it. And I say, nothing is impossible. We just need to know how to unearth that happiness. Nothing is too hard, and I have it in big, bold capitals. We know that happiness is not caused by things, people, or any particular situation. Yet stop to think for a while. Is there some idea, some situation, some experience which you would have liked to enjoy? Perhaps a career that you have put on hold or abandoned the idea as impossible? What about the beautiful relationship which you have decided has eluded you for this lifetime? What about some creative expression that was once your passion? What of the allure of a sentimental journey which once haunted your dreams? Lest you assume that I am suggesting that any particular desire will make you happy, let me clarify. The reality is that once we have set our intention to be happy, more and more we will be drawn towards experiences which are pleasant. More and more we will find the courage, the initiative to engage in the desires we cherish most. We are expressions of an infinite being. Our desires are promptings of this infinite being, seeking to find expression through us. It is as if this infinite being, God, within each one of us, is impelling us to give it free expression. This is a quote from Dr. Ernest Holmes, which I find relevant to this idea. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science, he says this, life flows into everything through everything. It passes into every human event and translates itself through every human act. If you learn to think of life as flowing through your every action, you will soon discover that things you give your attention to are quickened with new energy, for you are breathing the very essence of being into them. So you're cooking your soup, and you're knowing that the infinite is breathing life into your soup. So when you taste that soup, ooh, ooh, right? And even tofu, you know, for those of you who have not experienced it, right? Everything that you do, even the things you consider mundane, think of it as the infinite, just breathing life and energy into it. Within us is the seat of our authority, the nature of God the indistinguishable spark of divinity. The man who we knew as Jesus the Christ is the greatest example of the manifestation of the divine presence. He did not stumble into this, this is my opinion, he did not stumble into this status by chance. And although advanced above all others in his awareness of his relationship to the infinite, it is apparent from the biblical account that he did not arrive on the earth completely established in this awareness. Check it out. It is evident from the little we know of his life that Jesus had to apply all that he knew of the spiritual laws to arrive at this ascendancy. He proclaimed his oneness with God. The Father and I are one, but the Father is a one. Of myself I do nothing is the Father within that does the work. In doing the Father's work, Jesus, Jesus the same person who said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Yet he struggled with his own demons, doubt, fears, temptations, right? Check it out. In the end, however, he was able to demonstrate a state of being which some would label as nirvana. The blissful state of being, independent of things, but delighting in things. The narrative of Jesus' sojourn in the wilderness that marks the beginning of Lent, Jesus went through an inner dialogue with himself. 
Some people would like to say it's the, de the devil, yes, or Satan. But we know that Jesus was going through an inner dialogue with himself, those aspects of himself which would make him doubt, and those aspects of himself which would make him affirm. And I invite you to read the temptations that Jesus struggled with, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, Mark 1, 12 to 13, Luke 4, 1 to 13. But to say that Jesus had such inner dialogue, as indeed he did, is not to diminish the magnificence of Jesus, but rather in acknowledging, acknowledging his humanity, we can now pay attention to how he demonstrated to us and for us the approach to achieving the divine status to which he ultimately arrived. To make it seem as if his real purpose in being born is merely to be killed, I deem it to be a mockery of the lesson he so carefully laid out for us to see and emulate. He denies his own valiant efforts at self-mastery. If we accept that all he came to tell us is to love each other, as important as that is, there must be more. Men have done that before and since. If his greatest feat is to do miracles, heal the sick and raise the dead, so have others. Throughout his very short ministry, Jesus repeatedly indicated in his lessons and parables definite methods through his miracles, methods for achieving his, the goal that he achieved. Through his miracles, he demonstrated the scientific approach to self-mastery. The greatest demonstration, other than the ultimate triumph over his own death, was in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But even while giving his practical demonstrations of the scientific principle of mastery over conditions, Jesus, in his own words, um, outlined the scientific method using spiritual law, God's law. And who can forget these words spoken by the beloved master? Whatever things I do, and even greater than these things can you do, if you believe in me. This, I am convinced, is a call for a careful study of the methods which he used to arrive at his stardom. Yes, Jesus was a superstar, but most of all, he was a scientist, a spiritual scientist. Note, I did not say a religious scientist. I said a spiritual scientist. Why do I say he's a scientist? Who is a scientist? The Oxford Dictionary says, one who has studied science and whose job it is to practice what he has learned. A person who is studying or has expert knowledge of one or more of the physical sciences. Science is the study. What is science? Science is the study of the nature and behavior of natural things and the knowledge that we obtain about them. There is no doubt that Jesus understood the nature of the physical world even as much as he understood the, the spiritual world. The difference you will see between a natural scientist and a spiritual scientist. A natural scientist looks for his information from the outer world, while a spiritual scientist draws that information from a wellspring within his being and projects this state of awareness into the outside world by a phenomenon we call healing. Both use definite scientific systematic approach, is laws. One works from outside in, the other from inside out. Luke 11 and Matthew 6 addresses the scientific method of prayer as one of the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. So he taught them what was come to know as the Lord's prayer. So I'm going to challenge us. Let us say the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Congratulations, right? You did not need prompting. Now, I am going to share with you 
some thoughts. There have been many, many, many thoughts on, and reflections on the Lord's Prayer. I'll tell you mine. And you, when you would next say the Lord's Prayer, and I'm inviting you every day of the week to say it, but say it with a different meaning, not the usual, we didn't do that this morning, but sometimes we rattle it off like it is some sort of guzum, you know? And instead of thoughtfully going through each line and recognizing what it meant. So step one, our father. Who is the father? God. So Jesus in his teaching us to pray says, look to God, all things begin with God. And that attribute of God is love because it says our father, the attribute of father is love, right? Hmm? Don't say no, 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 no. <laughs> the attribute of father, he, Jesus implied it to be love. It is goodness, it is caring, it is a sense of security, it is givingness. Step, that was step two, A, no, it's two B. Our father not merely means, he's not, he didn't say my father, he said our father. So it includes everyone else. What is true of me in relationship to God is true of everyone else in relationship to God. So every time we are tempted to see another person in other terms other than God, the living spirit almighty, just remember our father our Father. That's all you have to remember, our Father. Which art in heaven. Jesus had already told his disciples where heaven was. The kingdom of heaven is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of heaven is within man. You know how many people can't find that in the Bible? Go check it out. Find it, right? Look for it. It is there. Right? Sometimes he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It depends on where it is. But meaning the same thing. Not when you die and sleep for some long time and then you wake up and, you know, mm -hmm. right? Right here at hand and that hand you take with you, that kingdom is the same kingdom you're going to take with you when you shed this body. So make sure that this kingdom is sweet. So when you are in that disincarnate state, that means without the body, you're like, in love with, your, with that heaven, just in love with the thoughts that you're feeling and experiencing, right? So, <laughs> can't hear? Okay. <laughs> hallowed be thy name. You know what hallowed means? Holy, whole, complete, totality of being, the allness of reality. God is all there is. Therefore, come back to it again, God is in all people, all creatures, all things, all phenomena, all experiences. God is all there is. Therefore, it makes sense when the Bible says, if I make my bed in hell, do I there, right? Yes, etc., etc., right? So anything that's happening to you, whether it's sweet you or don't sweet you, God is there. Call for the presence of God. Call it forth, right? With certainty, with definiteness. Thy kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. Remember that when we affirm, we go within. And that which is within becomes our experience. It corresponds whatever is within is that that is going to be projected onto the screen of life. So that is why we have to nurture and treasure that connection that we have with the kingdom. The kingdom is there, you know, it's not, that kingdom is there always. We're not going to create it, but we become more heightened in our awareness of it so that it, that divine spark will light us up and project itself into being in our lives and in our experiences. Give us this day our daily bread. Now the Ministry of Health has been telling us less bread, less rice. So we're not talking about that kind of bread, right? Bread here refers to our human desires, prerequisites, right? And 
You know, God is infinite. Therefore, the attributes of God are equally infinite, numerous. So we can think of some of the commonly acknowledged attributes of God, such as life, health, love, peace, you know, um, wisdom, you know, right action, right? All of those, anything we can think of. That's the bread, right? We can think of it, and it will come. Not just daily in terms of, you know, 24 hours, but continually, continually. So, you know, and it comes with a beauty and an orderliness and a symmetry in our lives, so that when we look out, everything is just lovely and beautiful to behold. And when it's lovely and beautiful to behold, we are in love with it. And when it is, we are in love with it, we feel at peace. And then we feel a joy that we are privileged to, to, to be living in this place called planet Earth at this time in this body, knowing what we know about life and the laws of life. Such a privilege. And now forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us, right? It doesn't mean when we forgive. Right? It means as we have already forgiven. And you know, after a while, we won't even say anything to forgive, you know. Because if we've been working on all the other steps up to now, it just become natural that we look past people's um, atypical behavior. Let me call it atypical behaviors. And accept that they are just, they're just growing. They're doing their thing. So, you know, God cannot lead us into temptation, so I believe that was a typo, right? And so we have decided, there are different versions of it, but we have decided in the temple to say, leave us not in temptation. So whenever we say it, we substitute, leave us not in temptation. And it's really an acknowledgement that once we have gone within and acknowledged all the attributes of God as ours, and our connection with God, then we won't feel the need to judge others. We will just accept them as they are. So, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. This is a triumphant conclusion to it. And we usually say it with a lot of energy. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Come and help me. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. This is a reaffirmation of in whom our trust and faith rest. It is an acknowledgement of the omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence, and omniaction of God. It means that God can do anything. God knows everything. God is everywhere, and God is active in everything. So when we say forever and ever, amen. I am saying the nature of God is unchanging, eternal, immortal. My trust in the constancy of God is complete. I base this assurance on the way God works, the same today and tomorrow. God is love and God is law. So friends, we can decide to be happy. Ernest Holmes tells us in poetry, Find me one person who knows how to talk to God, really talk to God, and I shall walk with him through the woods. And everything that seems inanimate responds. The leaves of the trees will clap their hands and grow soft under him. You can be happy continually. We can be happy continually. So I want with you, to, oh, <laughs> Reverend, um, the teacher that he is wants me to explain whether genetics plays a part in a happy disposition. I wonder what you think. That's a great question. But guess what genetics is? They have genetics and epigenetics. I believe, I don't think our teaching has fully developed the idea that there is a life before this, but I believe that we come packaged with all of the genetic predisposition that corresponds to the soul that we bring into this lifetime.
And the epigenetics means that while we're in this lifetime, every time we go through what I just went through with you, or anything at all which declares the nature of God in you and as you, you are tweaking and changing your genetic package so that not only will you automatically, after a while, this is why I say continually, if you work it, it will work you. And after a while, even if you want to be unhappy, it don't happen. You can't. It just don't happen. Right? And guess what? You will be passing on to your progeny, to your, that same genetics. Well, those of us who don't fast finish that stage, but for those, pass the good news out to your friends and others who are still in the position to have children. They can actually change the human race right here in each lifetime. This is something fairly, fairly new since we have been able to look at the DNA and check it out. Thank you for that, Reverend Michael. Right? Yes. I don't remember it because. <laughs> Speak it out loud because it, uh, we were visioning yesterday. And you know, when we vision, things come through your mouth and you don't know. <laughs> what you said? The, the what? The woman. Woman carries. The nascent idea of the nation. The female. The female carries the nascent idea of the nation. So when we nurture in the child. And guess what? Listen to me. Even if we're not going to have any babies in our wombs, guess what? What they say, it takes a village. So whenever you see any child, even if you don't say anything, just look the child in the eyes. Boy, since I have my grandchild, I just, every child just look beautiful to me. And I just can't, I just can't resist children, right? This is what being a grandmother does for you. And... Uh, do it, do it, and you'll be changing the human race in your own way, right? Thank you, Reverend. So, we're going to end with an affirmation. I'm going to read it first. There's a power upholding and sustaining me in everything I do and say. My strength cometh from the Lord. I am awake in the wisdom of God, not to the wisdom in the wisdom of God. I am awake in the wisdom of God, and that wisdom is where? In us, in you. So I'm going to break it up now. There's a power of holding and sustaining me. There's a power of holding and sustaining me in everything I do and say. In everything I do and say, my strength cometh from the Lord. My strength cometh from the Lord. I am awake in the wisdom of God. I am awake in the wisdom of God. Thank you. I feel your vibes. Namaste. <laughs>